Uh, so I kind of picked these in a little bit of a journey that I think tells the story of GBH in a way. So the first one being like the beer that even got me started, right? Like yeah. Cezanne Dupont is the beer that made me buy the URL Good Beer Hunting. Mm -hmm. That happened almost directly. Uh, the second beer I wanted to go to is from Greenbush mm -hmm. out of Sawyer, Michigan. Um, and the reason I picked these guys is because this is the brewery that made me want to take pictures. It's the first time that ever really happened for me. Oh, okay. Um, and you were loving on these guys back I in was. the day. I was. There was nobody else doing anything around here at the time. I mean, so me and my wife, we were on our way to Michigan. She lives in Grand Rapids, so we've worn a path between Chicago and Grand Rapids a million times over. And uh, we were on our way, and it was like a month later, we knew we were going to be coming up to southwest Michigan to have a house with some friends, hang out at the beach, that kind of a thing. And I asked her, I was like, why don't you, I was like, we're, we're driving through, you know, close to Sawyer, and I was like, hey, why don't you see if there's any breweries around here? We've never really thought about breweries around here. We didn't look for any, didn't know what was there. And she Googled one, and a pin dropped, and it said Greenbush Brewery. I said, who the hell is that? Yeah. So we pulled off, we figured we'd investigate, and if it was cool, we'd tell our friends, so when we came up in a couple of months, we'd be able to hang out there. And uh, it was a week before their opening. Okay. <laughs> it was just just complete coincidence. They were on top of that Google Maps thing, <laughs> yeah. man. I didn't get mine up until, like, <laughs> yesterday. Nobody does that. Yeah, I'm not sure why that was even there, but uh, we stopped in, and we knocked on the door, and Scott Sullivan was there, and we got to walk in. And the it, owner? Yeah, Scott okay. Sullivan, the founder, and... Uh, we got to walk in and we got to taste some of his early test batches and we got to see what he was doing with the space. He was building out the tap room. Not even all the stools were built. He make, you know, he's making them by hand. And, um, and it just, I don't know if, you, if you've ever been to Greenbush Brewery, you know, but it has this sort of like beautiful aesthetic of industrial meets like warm wood kind of tones. And I haven't been there. No. Uh, it's such a great little vibe and it's grown a lot over the years. It's nowhere near the same as it used to be, but it still has that sort of vibe, very friendly, very small town. And I don't I know, know the local town. Yeah. Loves it. Oh. I mean, everyone from yeah. around there is like, oh, it's like packed with locals. And if you go on and Facebook and say vibrant. something bad about their beer, people just assault you. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, Good and bad. Admirable. Yeah. <laughs> it's admirable. People defend their local beer no matter what. Yeah. Um, and I was just so inspired by the place. I mean, that sound, like that description doesn't sound, I guess, that unique anymore to, a, I mean, there's, a, you know, we've sure. all been to dozens of tap rooms, but at the time there was nothing like that, certainly not around Chicago. I mean, to this day, we don't have a lot of tap rooms in the city. Um, and so I was just so inspired by Scott and the, the aesthetics of the place that I just ran back to the car, got the camera, started taking pictures. And those, that was the first story I wrote on Good Beer Hunting that really had a lot of photos with it. Mm. Um, and it just kind of took off at that point. like. It was sort of this, this dovetailing of the timing of it. People were eager for craft beer knowledge because things were happening then. Um, and then also having photos for it. And it was you know local and kind of regional at the same time. Uh, it just kind of took off. And I was like, holy shit, people, people want stuff like this. People don't have access to this kind of information. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got excited about that from, I guess, both a content person and also an artist you know from the photography side yeah uh, and it was very cool to be able to shine a light on somebody like scott sullivan who was this like humble work a day former carpenter like really just giving his all I was so inspired by i guess by like his passion was contagious mm -hmm. um and it was cool and he was making a lot of giant beers at the time uh that nobody else was really making um and it was just a lot it was just a lot of fun and really inspiring so that's kind of what this represents for me is it was the first time i really started taking content um seriously as a producer okay and and also visually yeah well. visually I would say specifically for for Scott um, yeah it's uh, it, it is cool because thinking back now I'm, I'm trying to think back to when I was uh, and now that I am thinking more I think this is actually when I started reading good beer hunting yeah because uh, I remember you being like, man, this guy is on Greenbush's job. Like, he <laughs> loves this yeah. damn brewery. Unapologetically. Yeah, I mean, no, no, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, hey, I'm a fanboy for, for beers, and I'm unapologetic about yep. it. And, and Yeah, for me, it was always a mix of, uh, I mean, I like the beer. But and, it, well, what I was saying was but, it made me excited. It made yeah, me yeah, want to yeah. visit it. And it's still one of those things where there are a lot of breweries in the area that I have not been to, and that Greenbush is still the one that I feel like bad for not having been to yet. <laughs> I was like, why have I not been there yet? Yeah, I'm uh, Mug Club number 80 there. Wow. Yeah, if everybody wants, anybody wants to pretend to be me when they go in there, uh, put a hat on, get a beard, and ask for number 80. That is, old, <laughs> Mug Clubs are, do they even do Mug Clubs anymore? Every once in a while, it's sort of like a nostalgic thing to do right. at this point, I think. Yeah. It makes sense up there. I mean, like I said, the town defends that thing. Yeah. Up line and sinker. And uh, yeah, I like the beers. I mean, I've always liked some more than others. Uh, this is yeah. this is one that I think we had at my wedding actually, because uh, I got married up in Michigan. 
And it's just a solid pale ale, and uh, yeah. I think it's a work a day beer for them. It's not, you know, it's not something they hang their hat on. There's plenty of other ones that they that they uh, they love to talk about. But I was mostly inspired, I think, by the the, the sort of ground up entrepreneurialism and that's always been something that I think it's hard for people to understand that I get excited about that sometimes it's not the beer at all I mean beer is always a part of it but sometimes I'm inspired by the person or the business or yeah. the way they're the way they're building their business and the, the, the sort of strategic way they think very and unique they, about you I think in the beer industry everyone always says at the end of the day it's all it's in the glass and I actually don't agree with that statement. yeah I don't agree with that statement at all but I mean, I guess it depends on what you're talking about. Right. I think I disagree with that statement for a different, for different reasons. Yeah. But you, uh, more <clears throat> than certainly any industry person, I think is almost counter to that. That at the end of the day, all that matters is that stuff right mm. there. Um, and I think through your profiles, I think you kind of preach that you know mm. that it's 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 uh, is that fair to say i mean that's what it comes across to me is like that there is uh a culture to and a unique um life to each brewery yeah. and that those are important and that it might be important to try this beer because of that which actually i do agree with a lot yeah. i mean there's some beers that i will say this beer will be in my store no matter what. Yeah, I don't care. Does it keep... mean something to yeah, you? Yeah, it means something to me. And, that was, I want and it, yeah. the closest thing I ever had to a tagline, other than goddamn cultural rocket ship, was um, <laughs> um, the most the, the best beer in the world is a beer you actually care about. Yeah. Because in the end, I mean, that's we all latch onto something that's much more than what's in the glass. Because if you feel like what's in that glass is the greatest beer in the world, but you hate the person that makes it, you're not going to drink it. And that's a negative example. Right. Positive example is you love the man that made that. Right. That beer tastes better. Right. For it's sure. just fundamental. It's just how humans work. We're not robots. We're not objective in almost any aspect of our lives. Uh, we make subjective decisions all the time, and we actually love to romance our decisions. We love to rationalize why we like say things. That. I was just going to say that. I mean, people want it to be even better. They want uh, th then actually what's in the glass. Yeah, absolutely. They want this allure of Russian River being up in Sonoma and being hard to get. And yeah. I think the rarity is, is part of that as well. Rare it's is more, a flavor is the one way yeah. to joke about it, yeah. Um, or uh, going back to Sean Hill, a perfect example. I mean, his beers are stellar, yep. but then like the mystique, the pilgrimage. If you have memories like I do of having been on top of his mountain during a rainstorm yeah. and then rainbows came out, like it's, yeah, you're done. But people <laughs> love that, they want that. I mean, that has become part of that. Yep. And I think, uh, yeah. and I think that can be overemphasized the same way that I think the actual because liquid I think people can be over want it. People want they want it to be yeah. bigger than life. They want it to be. That's this. part of being alive in general. Like yeah. we want great experiences. We want things to have meaning where maybe there's only a shred of meaning to begin with. Right. Um, and I think that's okay. I mean, I think you can get extreme with that. The same way you can get extreme by saying none of that matters. Uh, I think that all matters to me. Like, and I guess that's a, an approach I've taken with beer hunting over time. Is that. Um, there's so much more happening in this idea of what beer is in America right now than just what's in the glass. I think what's in the glass has, is fundamentally important. Uh, I don't think you could ever, I don't think you could ever inspire anybody with terrible beer. Mm -hmm. um, but you can certainly get people to think about a beer a different way, um, put it into a context that matters. And sometimes that context is, wh you know, who made it, where it came from, what it represents. Uh, I think there's a lot of different roles that beer plays uh, that have nothing to do with going down your gullet. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it's always been a social thing. It's been a cultural thing. It's been a, like a it's an American business sort of thread. There's so many different stories in beer that are worth telling. That if I always started with just what's in the glass, I think it would be, I don't know, it would just be very limited for me. Um, it certainly wouldn't have nearly the interest that I would need to tell the stories I've been telling for so long. Okay, so I, I have a question, but I also want to get you to the next beer. So <laughs> you're in a rush with these beers. No. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so my shows are usually 15 minutes, not an hour. Uh, but we can we can go we can do a, an extended cut. Uh, beer. Is there a distinction to you between craft beer and non-craft beer? Hmm. I'm not talking about crafty. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, sure. The word craft has become less and less important, I think, in general, and certainly to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think it still has. It still has cultural currency. When you say craft beer, people kind of know what you're talking about, and I mm -hmm. think that's fine. I mean, words eventually kind of break apart and lose their meaning over time anyway, and that's a yeah. great example of one is 
Um, how do you define it? Who's defining it? I mean, it's a problem. But I think general consumers still have good intention behind using that word, and so I think it still has relevance. They still mean beer that's made by a smaller producer, whatever small means to you. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it means local. Sometimes it just means flavor. Um, and I think all of those things are positive things about beer to care about. Um, and everybody sort of has, like, you know, their own sort of hierarchy of needs or attractions. Like, yeah. does local matter more than flavor? Maybe fla flavor matters more to somebody else. Maybe independence matters most. Mm -hmm. um, I think, like most people, I make and it decisions with... Sorry. Oh, it shifts all the time. Yeah. yeah, totally. I mean, there are decisions that... Um, I mean, I don't know who the person who makes Cezanne Dupont, but it means something to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know the people who make the rest of these three beers, you know, to different levels, have different relationships with them. Um, so one of them is a business relationship as well as a personal relationship. We'll talk about right. that next. And so I don't know. I'm always shuffling those cards when I'm choosing a beer, uh, I guess, in terms of how much it matters to me. And sometimes I'm not shuffling cards at all. I'm just drinking whatever is there. And I think that's what you could say that to almost anybody. And craft. I think means different things to different people, probably also at different times, Absolutely. like you were saying. Some, I think, craft now to many people, especially many people just getting into beer, is a set of styles. Yeah, I think Stout, probably. Stout, IPA. Yeah, you're absolutely and, right. And I see know, it up. Sours are craft. I do market research sometimes, and I sit in bars and I listen and I write down everything people say, and that's exactly what will happen. They'll come in and be like, "Do you have any craft IPAs?" Right. That's such a weird phrase to me yeah but I get what they're coming from like that's what they're associating with it and I think that's okay too I mean in the end what matters to me most is that people believe that there is a craft in beer mm -hmm. and so you think what a huge is actual leap. currency in craft meaning this beer is crafted and uh, not just what's well, tagged onto it I mean, they're all signifiers for somebody, right? Right, yeah. Um, I mean, it's the same thing with cottage industry in general, Etsy, handmade, authentic, all American. Like, these are all words that mean something and then lose that meaning and then get, you know, and then get other meanings attached to them over time. Um, that's not specific to craft in any way. That's just how we fuck with language all the time. Yeah. There's nothing you can do about it. And so eventually everybody tries to find other words that, you know, artisanal became a word two years ago because people were tired of saying craft or handmade because those were kind of losing meaning. Yep. So they started saying artisanal because that had deeper meaning. I think up until that point, only people like Jolly Pumpkin had ever said anything like right. that. Right. Um, and so that still has very specific meaning within craft beer. If you're part of the industry or if you drink a lot, like you see the word artisanal, but you even that's very, very small. Bastardized. Oh, absolutely. Everybody now is artisan ales. Artisanal. I mean, do we think that there's a word we could pick that won't be bastardized? No, Not because a if it's a good idea, someone else is going to be like, oh, I love those beers. I'm inspired by it. It might be coming from a place of genuine... We could say the same, third about the, the same thing about the word Belgian. Yeah. I mean, we bastardized that long before we bastardized the word craft. Yeah. And so, to me, those words just kind of shift and change, and it's a muddy sort of idea the entire time. Uh, certain words and words like artisanal mean more they more right now than they will two years from now and that's sure. just we have to move on to new language but you have a little bit of deja vu about one of our yeah I mean this is exactly what we <laughs> talked about in in LA like yeah. the meaning of words and the transient nature of yeah. words and, and I think the only thing you can possibly do is accept the nature of those words it's hard to do it's hard to do because you get set in your ways, well, every, you like things the way they are, and when something changes it, that confronts your definition of it. Well, especially if you're I mean, somebody me who... especially, or I'm like, no, that's not that. And yeah. you want to be like... But I mean, who controls more. the lexicon? Nobody controls it. I mean, right. that's just the way it is. Um, I'm just saying it's hard to do. You know. experience the same thing as a retailer. When yeah. you have a good idea and you do something, and then a month later you see somebody else doing a similar thing, and you're that's just like, hey, happened. I introduced that. That's never happened. Yeah, that happens all <laughs> the time. I've never complained about that, ever, <laughs> to anyone. You know how many, how many of my friends have bought up variations of good beer hunting URLs just to fuck right. with me? Oh, that's uh, awesome, actually. <laughs> that's that's yeah. great. You're going to spend a lot of money, $15 a pop. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's stuff that changes over time. You have to be comfortable with the nature, like the human culture is not a static thing. We never, we have never in our in, in the history of man been able to say this is this and it un, and it goes unchanging. Mm -hmm. And so if that can't, if we can't do that at a macro level, we're certainly not going to do it inside this tiny little thing called craft beer. That in the end, nobody really gives a shit about that word. Um, for right. Now. I mean, in the end, it doesn't. It's well, people do give a shit about it for but now. It's not really. You zoom out twenty years and nobody cares again. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it is just a word. It's just a signifier. But for now, it has meaning. It. it helps us find beers that we're looking for. Yeah. The same way artisanal does, the same way Cezanne does. Yeah. Um, but and there shift. really is no other better tag to use right now. No. I, 
don't even know if there is any. The only the only thing you can hope for is that at some point people stop caring about those signifiers because they've gotten to know beer well enough yeah. that they can be guided by their own sort of right. volition. That they don't need those signifiers. Is like the only other one I can yeah, yeah. think of. Which, and that's when's the last dated. time you heard that word? Well, yeah. it's dated. You're dating yourself when um, you use it. Eventually, people get beyond signifiers. Signifiers are helpful to somebody who's finding their way. Once you've found your way and you have a lot of other more sophisticated tools to make decisions by, those words become meaningless. I don't see those words on labels anymore right? because they don't mean anything to me. Um, now I look for flavor descriptors. I look for hop notes. I look for, I don't know, Justin Bleeber. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Like, you start looking for different things that signify something to you that you have knowledge of, and that's all anybody's ever doing with those words anyway. And recognizing brands and stuff like that. I'm going back to Belgium where there is really uh it's, it's the most opaque, I think, between what we would consider craft and what we would consider big beer doing crafty stuff. Sure. There's well, it started very, long before it started here, yeah. Right. I mean, and, and there's no word for craft that I know of. Nope. And there's no signifier. It's just they, the consumers there... Who care to know? No, the ones yeah. who don't care expected, wouldn't care anyway. You're expected to like the beer or not, and if you care further, you get you, you learn about it. Yeah, and that's all there is to it. Yeah, um, and I think that's fine too. I mean, that obviously works on a much longer term level, which is, I mean, the we're talking about 200 years versus what 15 years. Yeah, say, or is also exploitable. I mean, I think that if you pull together under a moniker, you at least have some strength in that, and and that's what we needed. I mean, craft beer in America was. Uh, I mean, Steve Hindy calls it a revolution, right? And I think that's a little overblown, but he's, there's a kernel to what he's saying there is that here we needed those symbols because we were fighting a bigger idea. Um, I don't think that's the case when we go to Europe. Um, those traditions have long been living since before there was ever a big beer and it never died out like it did here. Mm -hmm. Here we went through that terrible sort of valley of lost, like losing that tradition of making beer in your own hometown. Um, so we had to fight for something. As that fight eases off, I mean, there's... Right. And, who and wants to be why, an aging revolutionary? And there's a million right? reasons why we, why we lost it. Um, but I think having lost it really put us kind of at an advantage to recreate something from yeah. the ground up. And, and we were no longer, or we, Jesus, no, craft beer was no longer muddled or just intertwined so mm -hmm. just completely. I mean, there's pros and cons, but there's always an advantage to be able to start from scratch. Right. Absolutely. And now it's okay. Well, we started here. You were already going. And it, it's such a stark contrast where, you know what? In 100 years, if this craft thing is still going, it probably will be so intertwined with I, everything else, just like in Belgium. I'll, I'll give it five years. Right. Yeah, at the most. I mean, it's already starting to intertwine quite a bit. Quite and I think bit. that's probably good overall. You think? That, yeah. I think... Uh, so now I do want to get to the next picture. Yeah, let's do it. Because this is a perfect example of... This is probably a great example of, uh, of what we're talking about now is... So the other side of Good Beer Hunting that started about two years ago, a little less maybe, is uh, I left my day job where I was a design and innovation consultant inventing new, new to the world products and services for companies like Nike, HP, Samsung. Um, helping them compete sort of long term. Mm -hmm. And I started doing that for breweries. Um, right around the time the market got started getting competitive, especially here in Chicago, which was about 18 months ago, um, all of a sudden my friends at breweries started asking questions that my clients at the agency were asking. Like, what do we look like in three years? Where's this thing going? Where's the white space? How do we compete? Do, are we making the right beers for the right people at the right time, mm -hmm. right? And uh, one of the first people to ask me to work with them to help them become more competitive and sort of have a long-term vision together, not only for the brand, but the product uh, in their portfolio, was Five Rabbit, my great friend uh, Andres Arai and his team over there. Um, and for me, that's, that's a sign of an industry where somebody like Five Rabbit isn't looking to compete with words like artisanal or craft or any of those things anymore. It's not enough to be part of a big bubble. Um, you have to stand out on your own two feet somehow. You have to have your own way of signifying that you're different or interesting or valuable. Um, and so they've done really, really well with these beers. Uh, they call them the Fives internally. I think that's what they officially call them now. Yeah. Five Rabbit, Five Vulture, um, Five Lizard, won some medals, mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite beers. They had, they'd struggled for the first few years contracting, uh, didn't go the way they Contract wanted it. Contract brewing being brewing yeah. off-site on somebody else's equipment. Yep. 
Yeah. Uh, and they always had a plan within, I think it was three years to build their own brewery. Uh, and, they, and they were going to use that as sort of a, a brand building time to get out into the market, learn some, you know, learn about the industry and get good at it, open up your own brewery and go for it. They realized, I think within six months, that that was a terrible idea because the beers they were getting from their contract houses were, were very inconsistent and they yeah. were really upset about it. Yep. They could never get the time they wanted on those systems and you're, you know, you're kind of a slave to whatever house yeast and malt bills they've got. And I don't know, it was just, uh, they, were, they recognized immediately that it was their biggest strategic asset, which is their beer, was not in their total control totally pivoted, decided to start building the brewery immediately, um, which thank God they did because once they once they got into their own house and John Jay came online from Goose Island and became a production brewer for them, everything changed. But the one thing that didn't change was that they spent all that time building a brewery and the brand had not, they hadn't really played with it, they hadn't had fun with it, they hadn't done things that they had originally been inspired to do when they were first starting up, they hadn't had a chance to dive in and develop it. And so they asked me if I would come in and join the team, not as like this weird consultant thing, you know, not like I'm coming to them and pitching PowerPoints and things like that. Uh, I essentially came on as like an embedded member of the team, extended member of the team, somebody who's in breweries all day long, all year long. I know what everybody's making. I know what consumers are talking about. Um, just a great outside rounded perspective, but also having the experience of facilitating the innovation process for large companies. So I was able to take these little pieces that I had learned over the last eight years of working with innovation companies. I was able to break them apart and use those as frameworks to help brewers do similar things. Um, start taking a longer view, like what does it look like three years from now? What are some of our strategic goals? Where do we want to be? Um, Barrelage sales, you know, portfolio, what does that look like? And then how do we break up a portfolio into different pieces so we can talk about it appropriately to different people? If you're not going to sell Magnifico wheat to the same person you're going to sell you know, be their own to necessarily. Those mm -hmm. are very fundamentally different approaches to beer making. Or maybe you are. Yeah, maybe there's definitely some places you will. Yeah. Um, but the We're problem was, that, you know, they had very strategic concerns like uh, how do we get velocity in one part of the portfolio so that we can spend time and money on other parts of the portfolio and let them grow slower so we don't put so much pressure on them. Just balancing things, basic sort of strategic frameworks. And it went so well that I ended up leaving my day job to do that full time for breweries. Um, I was kind of head over heels being able to take these skills that I had learned for these larger companies and just work with beer people, my yeah. favorite people in the world already. Right. Um, and be able to kind of help chart not only the future of their company, but I, you, I've probably worked with about 15 brands over the past year and a half. I mean, to some extent, that's making a dent in the industry overall, and it's starting to change the course for those companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it makes me really excited that I get to do that with them. Uh, and Magnifico Weed is one of the first beers that we did. We invented this sort of Gringolandia series. Uh, it was a word that one of the guys on their team came up with that I was really enamored with. Because we just wanted a part of the portfolio where we could have some fun, not make beers that cost a fortune to make, which a lot of the beers, you know, I mean, a lot of those are inspired by Randy Mosher. And it was really awesome to be able to work alongside him, not only as an artist, but a beer maker. Um, I mean, a lot of the beers they were making were worth it. They, and they were really well received, but they were so expensive to produce. That being the core of their portfolio made it hard for them to grow as a company. And so we had to, there needed to be another place where they could have fun. Um, they could play with language, play with imagery. Um, they could be their younger sort of more uh, kind of fly-by-night selves. And that's what I mean. This, if you would have seen that two years ago, you never would have said that that was a Five Rabbit label. Yeah. No. Uh, but now it kind of fits into a bigger, broader brand narrative for them, and I'm really proud of that. And it's doing really well for them. And Gringolandia is what I think, like, Latinos People, call yeah. America. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Like Disneyland. Right. Gringoland. Right. <laughs> yeah. Just sort of hilarious. Um, and that was us embracing the idea that, um, yeah, it's a Latino-owned, run, and inspired brewery, but. The majority of the people they're selling beer to, especially in Chicago, are going to be 30-year-old white guys that live on the north side. I mean, it's just the reality of the demographics for craft beer in general, um, mm -hmm. although it's improving and diversifying. And so we kind of just embraced that idea of the gringo and owned it and had fun with it. Right? And uh, I think they really like talking about these beers and telling that story now. And, um, yeah, it's just really enjoyable. And that's just a great example of the kind of work that I'm doing. I mean, that's when people ask, like, how do you make a living at Good Beer Hunting? It's like, well, not with the website, first yeah. of all. Yeah. <laughs> like you're mistaken if you think that I'm, because I don't do advertising, um, I don't do sponsored content, and those are very intentional because I don't want to be a slave to my website. I don't want to own, I don't want to have to owe somebody else analytics. I don't want to yeah. have to chase eyeballs with content. I mean, I think that's how you get buzz media and top 10 this, or why, you know, Chicago's the best at this, and that's why I don't want to be writing that. Yeah, that's why the web sucks so, so thoroughly in yeah. so many places. It's hard to make right money now. off of quality production.